waiting for the feed to go through and uh, voila. How are you doing, brother? So I'm good, and yourself? Uh, wonderful. How's the, how's the weather in Kenya? It's very cold. <laughs> Um, yeah, we are also getting some rain in Johannesburg. Yeah, but it's, well, it's not raining, it's just a bit, it's just cold. Oh, it's a bit cold. All right, hopefully it gets uh, get better. Better. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are live on uh, our Africa for Palestine uh, webinar series. Welcome once more. Thank um, you. Suhail, I'm, Suhail, is Suhail, I'm pronouncing it right, right? Yeah, yeah. You're one of the first few people to say it correctly on the first track. <laughs> oh, oh. oh okay. <laughs> right. Um, Suhail, welcome to the uh, Africa for Palestine webinar series. Um, welcome to our audience. Uh, welcome to our viewers as well who have been following this webinar series since it started in mid-July, if I'm not mistaken. Um, once more, uh, we uh, like to introduce ourselves on this webinar uh, series. Uh, we are Africa for Palestine, a Palestine human rights organization based in South Africa. We do our work in the African continent to raise Palestine awareness and to push back Israeli influence in the continent. We work with different organizations, uh, church organizations, we work with them. Um, your mosque movement, we work with them, the civil society movement, um, your political parties, trade union movements, um, and the broader civil society movement generally. We work with them, those that identify with our cause, the Palestine solidarity. We are also guided by the historical context of Africa's solidarity with Palestine um, from the early Pan Africanist movement. Um, in the early 60s um, to the recent uh, solidarity with Palestine throughout the African continent. We have had this webinar series, like I said, started in mid July 2020. We host different people on this webinar series academics, uh, activists, student activists, trade union activists, uh, leaders of political parties, um, different people from different walks of life in the African continent. We host them on this webinar series to speak about a large area of things, uh, including Palestine solidarity among many of them as well. Um, today, we, uh, we are honored to have uh, one of the co-founders of uh, an organization called Kenyans for Palestine out in Kenya. Um, their work is in and around uh, Kenya's solidarity with Palestine. Uh, Suhail is with us. Uh, once more, welcome to you. Thank you. Um, let, let's get right into it. So, just so tell us about uh, about yourself. Tell us about the work that uh, Kenyans for Palestine uh, primarily does. Uh, thank you so much, Ali. Uh, so, Kenyans for Palestine is a grassroots network of young people who came together um, to see what they can do about the uh, atrocities and violence that's happening in Palestine um, by the Israeli state. Um, so, our main ideologies are we want to create an international and intersectional um, uh, move towards um, solidarity. So in Kenya, there's been a lot of um, movement building, especially on the ties between Kenya and Palestine. We've had organizing, we've had movements such as the Kenya and Kenya and Palestine Solidarity Movement. And at the moment, there's a lot of diversification of this movement. So more and more people are interested um, with what's happening in Parliament, more people are, sorry, not in Parliament, in Palestine. Uh, more people are interested to know um, what's happening and how they can assist. And I think a key factor is on spreading awareness. You see, you can't know too much about what's happening in this area because every day there's something new. Every day there's a new form of violence. Every day there's a new form of, uh, there's a new atrocity against the Palestinian people. So the more um, movements we have, the better. Um, we're all united in the same course. So Kenyans for Palestine is just uh, a branch of the already existing uh, uh, Palestinian solidarity movement in Kenya. Um. 
Uh, thanks for that. Uh, those of us who are interested on the Palestinian question in the African continent who would be interested interested to learn about um, relations at government level. I think that's where that's where we start. How, how are the yeah. relations between between Kenya, the government of Kenya, uh, and uh, Palestine? How are those in the country? I think to understand government relations, you have to look at Israel and the tactics and uh, weaponization of diplomacy they are using. So Israel uses a lot of intimidation and um, threats for them to garner this um, government ties and diplomatic ties. So in Kenya, I would say Kenya was among um, the foremost countries in Africa to recognize, not even in Africa, I think in the world to recognize um, Palestine as um, uh, an independent state, uh, and also to recognize the Palestinian quest for statehood. Um, and as of now, we do have a Palestinian embassy in Kenya, and it's hosted in uh, Kenya's capital city. But I think since um, 2013, um, at the African Arab Summit in Kuwait, the president had also um, declared that they that he, on behalf of Kenya, um, will support the people of Palestine um, to acknowledge and have the state and self uh, to have uh, statehood. But I think the first indication of the national uh, policy shift, especially on Kenyan Palestinian time ties would be on uh, in late 2017 during the, the United Nations General Assembly um, emergency sitting on the um, longstanding international consensus of the state of Jerusalem, where Kenya did not vote and abstain from voting um, on this matter. So I think since then, we've seen a lot of policy shift and more and more ties with Israel um, coming from a governmental level. But so far, um, we've seen the government um, supporting grassroots movement, supporting the Palestine, acknowledging um, what's happening in Palestine and calling out Israel in some of the, some of the atrocities they do um, commit. So I would say there's no blanket term to term it as full solidarity or no solidarity at all. I think it shifts based on the interests of Kenya and more or less um, the government's interests. Uh, uh, so maybe, uh, we, we must be honest also about the wave of Israeli influence in the continent. Um, not so long ago, they were forcing themselves to get observe, observer status in the African Union. Um, yeah. They attempted an Israeli Africa summit, if you remember, three years back in Togo that couldn't go through. Um, they are trying to get inroads into Uganda. They have gotten inroads recently to Morocco. Um, so there's that particular way throughout the African continent um, of Israeli kind of infiltration. Do you, do you think there's a political will um, on the part of the Kenyan government at this particular point in time? Um, to let's say not place for that, but to kind of resist that particular um, infiltration. Yeah, I think we can look. We can look at the infiltration of Israeli um, uh, Israeli infiltration in Africa as the new scramble of um, Africa, because there's a lot of interest by the Israeli in Africa, and we've seen with the recent um, normalization ties uh, in. Uh, Morocco, in Sudan. So they are targeting certain countries. Um, but for Kenya, as I was saying earlier, I think it's very, it's very, there's no blanket term to say, because I remember um, before the, before the planned annexation um, this year on, um, when was it? Uh, July 1st, um, the Kenyan government did um, condemn the actions of Israel in the annexation of the West Bank and uh, the Jordan Valley. So that was very, that was a very strong condemnation that we saw. Um, and it had been a while since we had seen this sort of condemnation from the Kenyan government. But I think back to your question, there is some sort of political will, but not very visible as of now, because even when the government does these things, it's not on the front of the government of Kenya, it's particular progressive members of parliament or uh, progressive legislators who bring this who bring these issues up. Um, so, as we know, there's a lot happening, especially in Kenya's uh, Kenya's governance and political realm. So it's very difficult to acknowledge this, especially for them at this point, because 
even if we look at Kenya, um, they are they are taking a lot of tactics from the Israeli um, government. So how they are oppressing the citizens here in Kenya is the same way the Israeli the Israeli government is doing it. So to some extent, we look at this um, solidarity as flexible diplomacy, like you're calling this out, but you're doing it at home. So we aren't quite sure where the government does stand as of now. Uh, we've seen the recent condemnations, the most recent being in June of this year, but we haven't seen any action coming with these condemnations. Uh, um, yeah, interesting you should, uh, you should, that you raise the concern about uh, the treatment of, of the citizens of the Kenyan government. Uh, we, we, are, we are well aware of, uh, Kenyatta's not so nice human rights record. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we realized also is that Israel wants to target this type of leaders in the African continent, Museveni in Uganda, um, the dictator in Togo, um, the illegitimate government now in Sudan. Um, so this is the type of friends Israel likes to keep. Um, yeah. And uh, even with the Arab normalization, those are undemocratic, backward and repressive regimes in those, in those countries. So that is the company that, uh, that Israel keeps. Um, and we've seen, um, I think two years back, when Kenyatta spoke about some type of a wall um, between Kenya and Somalia. And, and Somalia, uh, yeah. Netanyahu so was, look, um, if you want a wall, I can give you some advice. Um, and recently also, um, the United States government has threatened to cut the free trade deal with Kenya if they don't normalize relations. I mean, we've seen this, this is how um, the United States under Donald Trump's administration coerces, um, coerces unprogressive regimes and governments, because I don't believe there's a progressive regime and all government that can agree to being coerced into normalizing relations. So there's been those, we've seen those in newspaper reports. We, we had that the, the corridors of, of diplomacy that um, Trump's threatening to cut the free trade deal. Do you, do you see this as something happening in Kenya? Yeah, I would say uh, not just Israel, but the strong collaboration and um, uni unity uh, that comes with, uh, between Israel and America is based on economic bullying. This is, a new form, it's not a new form of diplomacy we're saying, but it's not diplomacy as per se. It's a sort of domination. These two countries are coming together to dominate over other countries in the world for their own self-interest. Um, so the, the reason of this form of normalization, especially with countries in Africa, is to legitimize um, the violence that's happening in Palestine by the Israeli embassy, uh, sorry, the Israeli um, government. Because when we look at it is, once in the international arena you do have diplomatic ties with many country it seems they are more that will come on board but to start this normalization ties you have to start from somewhere and a country like kenya is very weak when it comes to economic dealings it's uh, severely in debt it's uh, severely in debt it's it has a lot of it uh, relies and depends on a lot of aid from america and israel so when president trump um comes and says that if you do not sign this agreement, we are going to cut off um, this aid coming in. So it comes about, even I, um, I think with the recent free trade um, deal, there was the, there was the um, agreement that the Kenyan government is going to also crack down on any politically mo motivated um, BDS movements in Kenya that's, that seek to um, disrupt any Israeli dealings in Kenya. So if, if you look at such agreements, the main role is not di diplomacy and economics anymore. It's more or less about bullying. It's more or less about domination. It's more or less do this or we, we, we pull out. Uh, uh, also, this is uh, this normalization type of agreement is to legitimize um, internationally uh, the illegitimate state and apartheid state of Israel. Um, as we I think we've, we've spoken enough about, about the government, and I think even our audience uh, will well understand uh, Kenyatta's type of leadership in Kenya and the way we've seen um, with the human rights record. Um, let, let, let's now focus on society, on Kenyans themselves, on activists like yourself and those you organize with. 
Um, how's been the approach to to Palestine solidarity? Uh, we, we've seen that. I'm aware that Kenya and Palestine was also not so from, not so long ago. Your organization that you co-founded also was not so long ago. Um, how's the approach to Palestine solidarity? Is it something that's very recent? Or is it's just that the organizations that are formalizing it like the one of yours? I think in Kenya there's been strong, there's been a strong sense of understanding transnational solidarity. So Kenyans are aware of what's happening in Palestine. They have been doing a lot of work um, virtually, and those who are in the civil society space have been trying to make um, Legislate, uh, legislation to back their claims. But I think until recently is when we started having this formal organizations coming up. Initially, people would do uh, a lot of this organizing more, more or less underground. Um, and even now, as we look at it, we see it's not just civil society and mainstream NGOs who are standing in solidarity with Palestine. We see um, organizations um, and social justice initiatives from the urban informal settlement in Kenya. Um, like recently, there's uh, a social justice center called Wahenga Youth Group in one in uh, in one of the in one of the largest slums in all the slums in Kenya who put up a who put up a painting um, on an empty wall on the uh, standing in solidarity with Palestine. So such such groupings are also important because it shows us that once you're in solidarity with Palestine, you understand the specifics of. Our, oppressions are inter our oppression is intersectional with theirs. So in Kenya, we have different groups, um, the civil society, we have um, religious um, groups who've been very active in uh, both the parliamentary status, uh, but the parliamentary level, level to organize and bring up the issue and question on Palestine and Kenya's legitimate standing on what is, the, what is, the, um, what is Kenya's standing on the issue. So we've seen a lot of education and awareness, and just as Kenyans for Palestine has joined in, we've had organizations like um, the Kenya Palestine Solidarity Movement that has been doing a lot of education, education, a lot of uh, spreading a lot of awareness on what's happening. They have different groups where they disseminate information. So I wouldn't want to say the 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 scope of standing in solidarity with Palestine is new. It's something that's been there, but I think it's just becoming more and more formal now. Um, like for example, like grassroots organizations um, such as activists and organizers, regardless of uh, the background, have been coming together to have um, webinars to discuss what's happening, forums in the different settlements of what's happening. Um, so it brings people together. So there's a lot of community building that has also transpired um, through organizing solidarity with Palestine. Um, I think for religious groups, there's also been there because we've had um, the Muslim groups such as um, Jamia, um, opening up the uh, TV stations for uh, forums discussing what's happening in parliament and uh, sorry not in parliament in Palestine and they do um, invite a lot of these open grassroots organizers and we've also had individuals who are taking up so I think for for civil society if we look at the mainstream NGOs we also have to look at it from a perspective of um, how it affects their logistics and how it affects their operations because you see also a lot of this a big um, non-governmental organizations and this mainstream organizations uh, what what they do and the um, what they can assist in is always um, specified with budgets and these budgets are always from donor funding um, based uh, grants funds whichever it is so in Kenya we've seen organizations like Amnesty um, supporting in logistics we've seen the Kenya Human Rights Commission um, supporting uh, logistics and um, solidarity to the events we do hold. Um, like recently, there was the uh, event where there was a Palestinian author who came, they assisted with logistics and the book signing, um, planning the event um, and all these things. But I think the key thing also comes about on the divide that's caused by these funds and where this funding comes from. Because I think as of now, we, uh, there's more people who are becoming aware of how Israeli funds and American funds work and what's based on this agreement. So even as civil society tries to overcome these barriers, it becomes difficult for people to, for them to sustain this ongoing solidarity because maybe this, this year they can do this, they can assist in uh, logistical support, but maybe next year the person who's funding them has ties to um, Israeli organizations or, I'm uh, sorry, Israeli state uh, organizations 
that didn't allow such things. So I think it all goes back to um, the funding. But I think so far we've seen uh, a good percentage of the civil society coming on board and supporting the course. Uh, um, I think it's interesting that you you mentioned that uh, even the, in the poorest of the section of uh, Kenya society, there's a strong um, kind of solidarity. In South Africa, we we are very much um, uh, active in the poor communities in the country. And um, I think was it uh, was the year back, there was a, a former liberation fighter who was living in one of the slums. And when he passed on in his shack, there was a, a big flag of Palestine in his shack. And, and that type of solidarity you want. Genuine, heartfelt solidarity from normal, ordinary people on the ground. And, and congratulations on your part for doing that in Kenya as well. Um, so we, we, we've seen a really interesting trend um, coming up in the last couple of years, where young people in the main are in the forefront of the Palestine struggle globally. Um, and even in Palestine, uh, we've seen the great march of return being led by young people in Gaza, young Palestinians um, in the forefront of it, um, saying we've had enough. Um, we have enough of occupation, we have enough of the blockade. In the West Bank as well, we've seen a, um, uh, uh, a surge of young people um, um, resisting the occupation, either through violence, through non-violence, but num a lot of young people are doing the in, in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement, primarily and in the main is young people uh, at the forefront of the social justice issues in the United States. Uh, and I can argue in many other parts of the world as well. Um, in South Africa, we've seen a number of young people saying on the issue of international solidarity, we've had enough and our government should start doing one, two, three, and four. I'm sure you're familiar with how young, young South Africans are calling for the for the country to leave its progressive moral stance and sanctions uh, and uh, um, adopt sanctions uh, on, on Israel. Um, so is that, do you see the same in, in Kenya when you, in you, where you organize or on campuses? Do you organize there? And what's the feeling of young people in Kenya? I think at the moment, um, if anything, um, the Palestinian, uh, the, the need for Palestinian solidarity has exposed is the need for intergenerational organizing. And I think that's what's happening. I think there's a lot of intergenerational organizing and collective unity from the older, the older um, active citizens, activists, organizers, um, influ influential persons in academia, wherever they've been, they've been doing their part um, towards the, um, in regard to the Palestinian question. So I think a lot of young, um, participants now who are joining the movement are learning a lot from the, the older organizers and activists who've been doing this for ages. Um, I think recently, even during the Black Lives Matter uh, protest in, uh, the, in the US, um, there, was, there, was the, there was the solidarity coming from Palestine where the Palestinians came together and said, the Palestinians support the Black Intifada. So I think that was very important because it showed that the interconnection that's taught, and it's very intergenerational because many young people will be able to understand what happened during the first intifada. Uh, but now seeing them um, correlate the different struggles shows that there's a lot of intergenerational um, organizing. The elders are taking their time, resources um, to assist us younger um, people who are new into this to understand what's happening in terms of education, in terms of logistics. If it's planning um, a call to action, they're always at the forefront of assistance. Most of them are always just a phone call away. Um, and I think even uh, during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of uh, action that has been very, even when you look at different panels, you see very diverse panels. So you see very old people, it's very young people who come together to discuss these matters. So I would say um, elders do play a huge role in not just education and awareness, but also strengthening communities and especially younger people who want to join this movement. Um, uh, do you, and uh, we, we often ask um, guests who come on, our, on this webinar series a lot that, do you, 
do you see a future of Palestine solidarity, particularly in Kenya? Where, where do you see it going in the next 10 years to, um, in terms of your organizing on the ground? And we may not know, we may not speak for our, gov our governments can, can respond on the Palestine question. Uh, we, we campaign every day, we try every yeah. day to change their policies and so on. But, but the people we organize, is, uh, we organize with, uh, where, where do you see that in the next five years in Kenya, in the next 10 years too, where do you see the, this type of solidarity going? I think in 10 years time, or even, even less than 10 years time, we have achieved um, such um, momentous forms of organizing where there's more people coming along. Because I think I would say we are in the age of abolition and if people do demand worldwide, globally, we've seen people calling for the abolition of police, we've seen people calling for the abolition of sanctions, we've seen people calling for the abolition of militaries all over the world. So I think if you look at this perspective and then you look at the Palestinian question, um, I think Angela Davis puts, puts it very well and, see, and she says, what's happening to Palestine by Israeli is the largest cost of, is the largest form of a carceral society. So if we are fighting um, incarceration now, we are fighting violent policing, it means we have to stand in solidarity with Palestine. And I think even now we are moving away from liberal forms of activism. It's not about flexibility. It's not about um, compromising with the demand for freedom. It's not about compromising when we're asking for our rights. It's reached a point we're not begging anymore. It's we are demanding and we will achieve this. So I think Africans, especially in Kenya, are also taking a broad um, Pan-Africanist um, an Africanist form of organizing because we've seen a lot of organizing that's between Tanzania and Kenya. Like regardless of borders and territories, now we've seen that we have to come together as Africans and stand in solidarity and um, amplify the demands and make sure whether in ten years, whether not in ten years, we have a very strong um, united front. So once we make our demands to our governments, they will have no choice but to listen to us. Because you see, I think a lot of governments. Um, use diplomacy as a form of um, flexibility when it comes to policy making. But if you look at it very intrinsically, it's it's a lot of hypocrisy. They might say this, but on the on the side of um, policy making and listening to the citizens, it's a lot of hypocrisy. So I think once we have this unified front, which is growing rapidly every day, I would say we can look at South Africa, which has led. Um, the BDS movement for a very long time. We can look at Malawi, we can look at Tanzania, we can look at um, Nigeria and many others that I, I might not be able to mention. It's it's a growing um, an Africanist front. So that's very important because rather than looking at just Kenya and looking at just South Africa, we look at it continentally because we many Africans do understand um, the brand like the brunt of colonialism, apartheid, um, segregation. Um, so they do understand what's happening in Palestine and they have the desire to join in the struggle and ensure that everyone is free. <clears throat> Thanks for, th thank for that, Sue. And I think uh, also for our audience that are watching, um, we also believe that in 10 years time, there will be um, much more intensified campaigns. Um, but you're right, Sue, there's a, there's a growing an Africanist um, movement growing in the continent. Um, the, the, uprise, the, the Arab uprising in Egypt, but um, it's a tip of the iceberg for it. You have uh, students in Ghana taking down stages of people like Mahatma Gandhi for their racist, um, and the racist behaviors back in the day. You have students in South Africa who the peace must fall, the rose must fall. So you have a lot of decolonization type of um, discourse in the African continent. Um, you have um, um, students in Nigeria uh, protesting in the streets for Palestine, and uh, this is the growing pan-Africanist movement in the in the continent. And we also believe in ten years' time it will be enough. I, I think ten years back from now, um, yeah. nobody will believe that no young people will stand up and Africans themselves will be um, will be carving their own way out of colonization. And I think. Uh, um, in 10 years' time, I think me and you will be old and be more younger people. <laughs> yeah. Younger people <laughs> will be doing things differently and more creatively than us. Um, yeah, I would say also um, the young people are very radical. They aren't here to compromise, they are here to demand. And I think a key thing is also during the end SARS protests uh, in Nigeria, we, all, we always mm -hmm. saw 
the coming up of the Palestinian question, it's like solidarity with Palestine, some of them have a black hand with solidarity to Palestine. Even in um, with the end Anglophone crisis um, protest, we saw the same thing. In with the BLM protest, we saw the same thing. In Egypt, we've seen the same thing. And most recently in Sudan, we also saw the young people um, sp protesting the, the recent normalization deals with um, the state. So it seems a lot of people, even in the political will, what we need to understand is we aren't creating our own, our new forms of political will. We're just amplifying what the Palestinian demands are against um, Zionism and we will help them amplify these demands. We're not creating any new forms. We won't allow our governments to create any new demands that the Palestinians don't want. We won't allow our governments to co-opt these movements and, and uh, try to sanitize um, the Israeli dealings um, based on economics or based on uh, policy and legislation. I think young people are really, are really demanding and they are at the forefront of not, the, for them, anything, for them, they'll do anything to make sure this happens. And there's also the now the the influences from young organizers in Palestine, like Ahed Jamimi. So when young people see these young children being attacked and being and fighting for their rights, it gives them this sort of motivation to join in. Like recently, we saw the young boy who was shot um, by police, and then it was justified by um, a stray bullet. So this continued um, declaration or acknowledgement of Palestinians dying um, at the ex uh, Palestinians dying at the expense of uh, Israeli bullets is also being justified as collateral. So most times they won't give us the names; they just give us a child. They'll give us this number of Palestinians have been ejected from their land. So they are trying to use to weaponize these statistics so that to try and sanitize and make sure that what Israel is doing seems very just in the in the international arena. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. Um, the Palestine, the Palestine solidarity struggle seems to be intersectional, intersectional everywhere. In the African continent, protests against police brutality, state violence, militarization. Um, you're definitely going to see a Palestinian flag in that protest. Yeah. Um, in, in South Africa, there's been protests also against sexual violence, and the feminist movement in South Africa, even in their struggle against the uh, uh, patriarchy and sexual violence speak out in solidarity with Palestine even in those spaces. So there is an undenying, growing, impatient, pan-Africanist colonial movement in, South, in, Afri in the African continent that uh, grows from strength to strength with Palestine. Um, yeah, and I think also, there's also the need for, like looking at Kenya, there's a lot of militarism and a lot of surveillance has been enabled by the Israeli government. So if when we look at these things, you see um, Kenya as a government will stand up and say, we want the sovereignty of the Palestinian state, but at the same time, they are meddling with um, Somalia's internal affairs. So it's not a matter of, I think it's also a realist perspective of them just trying to look good for themselves. Uh, like recently in a report by the citizen, um, let me just confirm, um, the citizen lab. Um, out of the seven countries that had the Israeli um, espionage system that governments were using to spy on the citizens, out of the seven African countries, one of the countries was Kenya. So there's a lot of infiltration um, by, is by the Israeli regime in Kenya at the moment because they they have been the key in, in using, um, in enabling militarization under the guise of fighting anti-terror. We've seen them um, fueling thousands of dollars into this um, arms deals, they're the ones who are providing Kenya with uh, multi-million deals of uh, 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 procuring tear gas, arms, guns, uh, bullets, all these things. So I think a lot of Kenyans are starting to understand the toll of Israeli domination, not just in Palestine, but even in Kenya, because we see what's happening every day. Even as Israeli, the, Israel, um, the Israeli regime is breaking international law, we see Kenya is doing the same because um, according to some of the international treaties such as the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention, this, they banned the use of tear gas. But we still see many, we see Kenya, when you're fighting for Palestinian rights, you're to curb dissent, the tear gas protesters, regardless of what protest it is, protesters are always tear gassed, whether violent or non-violent, you're always tear gassed 
which is in contravention of international law. So just like Israel, and I think with the continued normalization of, of ties between Kenya and Israel, we are facing a risk of going back into authoritarian militarism, militarist rule. Because at the moment, if you look at countries like Kenya, um, there's been a military takeover of Kenya's capital. We're being led by an unconstitutional parliament. So it's very difficult to bring out such issues without looking at the interceptions of how it's happening in Palestine and how it's happening here. So I think also for, Net, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, it's very easy because the same tactics he's using in Palestine are the same tactics President Kenyatta is using here. Oh, definitely. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We really do appreciate that. Uh, what we know is that the Palestinian struggle is not a side hustle. It's not something we do in our spare time. As Mandela said, we are not free until uh, Palestinians are free. Martin Luther King Jr. said, um, injustice anywhere, that threat to justice everywhere. So, you're correctly saying that um, Israel is just not only an enemy to Palestine, but is an enemy to all kinds of people worldwide. Um, yeah. one, of, one of the people watching live is asking, how can, how can people be in contact with, uh, with you and your organizations in Kenya? So if I'm in Kenya, uh, or if I'm not in Kenya, wherever I am in the world, if I want to be in contact with you, what do I do? You can uh, always contact any of the platforms on social media. On Twitter, it's um, Kenyan, Kenyans for Palestine, Kenyans uh, number four, Palestine, and it's the same on Instagram. Or, and I think the email is also um, labeled on the Twitter page and Instagram page. So great, we're going to put that in the comment section. Um, but if you look at the comment section, the organization Kenya for Palestine is also there, um, the title of the live video. Um, so you can contact them there, you can inbox them on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, or you can just send a shout out on Twitter as well that respond to you on the timeline, uh, but that's where they are reachable. Um, again, so thank you very much. We wish you all the best in your work in Kenya, and uh, uh, we know that working together, um, victory is setting. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting me. Have a good night. You too.